ask them to. So, you know, they'll measure your calcium and magnesium, and they'll measure your micronutrients, and they'll, they'll do your base saturations and your CEC and all that stuff if you ask them to. And it's a good lab. I mean, it's a good, reputable lab. They'll do a good job. It can get to be kind of expensive that way. But there are labs that do this routinely, and you should be able to find a test like that for about 25 bucks. That'll do all those things. So, so that's a good point. You know, we do care about, even though, even though all the research that we've seen does not necessarily support this, observation and farmer experiences suggest that there is something to be said for watching the amounts of calcium and magnesium that we've got to work with. Magnesium poisoning is, is way overplayed, okay? You know, we don't have the situations here that, that plants are going to be dying from excessive magnesium. But if we try to bring the calcium proportions up, usually things perform better. Usually it's easier to keep the structure in the soil where water can infiltrate, where the soils can breathe and stuff like that. And so those things I think are important. And just like Joanna was saying about pH, you know, from, from what Peter said, this pH is just where it's supposed to be. I'd like to see, I'd like to see that pH up around six and a half for this kind of a swarm. Because the plants will provide a little bit better yield, but the quality is going to be a lot better and you're going to get a lot better biological activity at a little bit higher pH like that. So please keep that in mind when you're thinking about these pH recommendations on, on the pastures. Um, let, let's just dig here. When you guys are out on farms, you know, you're, you're probably not going to have a backhoe with you, <laughs> and the farmer probably doesn't want you to go digging backhoe pits all over, even though that's a lot of fun. <laughs> I love doing that. But, you know, this, this tool right here can tell us a lot, and, and, and these things can tell us a lot, too. And, and no walking one. through here, did you guys notice, you know, no. you, you don't drag something. your feet when you're walking through this pasture? That's a thick sword. That's a beautiful sword. You know, so those are things that you can observe. And those are things that relate not only to feed quality and feed supply and cow health and all that, but they relate to soil health too. So I'll, can I dig a hole and then I'll put the dirt back when we're done? Okay. So we talked a little bit about diversity inside. So what do you guys see here for species? Two or three different kinds of clovers probably, yeah? Yeah, at least. 30% dandelion. Dandelion. Clovers, dead. Ryegrass. Yep. Bluegrass. Yep. So plantains, uh, dandelions, a couple of kinds of clover, ryegrass. Uh, looks like there might be a little orchard scattered throughout. Um, some bluegrass. Anything else? Oh, I see some red clover there too. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure you know there's a fair amount of timothy in this too. You'd be surprised how much timothy would actually be in here if you actually had it. Look like? Well, it's hard. It's hard to spot it. You know, a young timothy well, is. That's well, past June. Right it's going to be hard. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, got a head on it already. Yeah. Yeah. Right there it is. <laughs> but, you know, it's Timothy. Well, that's all. Timothy has a W in it, right? Peter's stepping on the Timothy. Pass a couple of clumps around here for you guys. Do what? Sorry. Have the W in it? What is the other That was wrong. Timothy does too? I think yeah, Timothy has the W in it too. Is that no, no. T Does Timothy is the one that has the kind of like a scallion. Soil structure. The 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 stem a at the base is kind of like a like a. And you guys are all ripple. Oh, so like a like, a like a little like oh. a little scallion. Okay. Mm. Scallion. Okay. Yeah, that would yeah, be right. Yeah. That would be right. Yep. Right. That or that's. The W1 is uh, smooth, bro. Yeah. Instead of little bonus sample here, kind of Oh, nice. Okay, I'll send I'll send one of these around the other way. So when you guys are looking at this, you know, what do we want to see as far as what kind of structure are we looking at here? What what would we love to see if it was perfect? Got an angleworm in there? Oh, it happens, yes. Yeah. This is worm city. That's what I was gonna say. That would be the first thing. But when, when we're talking about the aggregation of the soil, what, what kind of what kind of form of aggregates would we like to see? What's shape? 
like, like granular structure is what we would call them, right? So Bill, Bill, describe granular structure for us. Moderate, medium, triangular, black, and blue, as we used to call them great. You didn't forget that to your university or so, college? So when we say <laughs> granular structure, yeah, no, we, mean, we mean it's like when you open up a freshly baked loaf of homemade bread or, or like when you when you take a spoonful of cottage cheese out of the container, right? You know, those nice little rounded globules. And so we would like to see that and we'd like to see that throughout the whole, at least the, through the whole topsoil. So what would that structure change to if we had a lot of problem with compaction? You know, so. Too many cows running through here when it's too wet, stuff like that. Pressing down on those granules, what do they turn into? I think it's platy. Yeah, plates. Yeah, yeah, they turn into platy structure. Okay, so I'm not seeing that here. Usually, in most pastures, we see that in the first two or three inches. We see platy structure. And when that happens, that shuts off the soil. You know, it, it's very hard for water to infiltrate there and it's very hard for the soil to breathe. And it's important that the soil breathes because we think about plants being photosynthetic and taking in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen. That's great, that's wonderful, we need that to happen. And I'm glad it does or we'd all be dead. But that only happens above ground. That's only happens during the day. They can, they can finish up a little bit after dark, but when there's no more sunlight, they can't keep doing that. So those plants are respiring and the roots are respiring. So I, I'm good, thanks. So we want that soil to breathe. We want, air to, we want air and water to get in. We want carbon dioxide to come out. So we don't want to see that plate structure. So if you're working with the farmer and things aren't working real well in the pasture, and you go out there and you see a bunch of plate structure after they go to the pasture, what are the remedies for that? Well, first of all, let's back up a little bit. How did the soil get to be granular to begin with? Root action. Root. Root action. Well, this soil is inherently, maybe start with that. The soil, at least in this part of the state, is inherently plated to begin with. It took the sod to break it into granular. It's aeolian loss. Well, it's laminar at least, yeah, right? Laminar. Yeah, Yep. Yep. That's so, a good point. So the fact that what Peter has done here, or this farm, is amazing because it's already changed it from what it wanted well, how it was established. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. This is really impressive because I happen to have looked at soils all over this county for 30 years. <laughs> to see it that nice of a soil and, and the feel of it is, is very impressive. Yeah, so so somebody said roots and that's true. You know, having lots and lots of root activity, particularly fibrous roots like we get mostly from grasses, really helps to set the stage for that. What else is going on in here? Did anybody see any worms? Yeah, yeah there's all kinds of them right here. Yeah, those worms are wonderful structure builders. Every time they leave worm castings on the soil, that's automatic granular structure right there. He picked one of them. So they're granular structure manufacturers. And there's all kinds of biological things that go on to creating granular structure. So knowing that that, that is a, a function of biology, if we find plating that's oh. developing, what, what do we want to enhance to overcome that and restore the granular structure? Nodules. I'm hearing organic matter and roots. That's your nitrogen factor. Biology, right? Okay, because everything else that lives in the soil here, you know, the, the about probably 10 billion organisms that I'm holding and right here. Everybody move. there, except for mycorrhizal the fungi, big, uh, which are a little different, but everybody else is plants. living on dead Do plant matter. You know, so the bacteria and the the degrees. Yeah. Oh, yes. Temperature and, and pressure micro, mm -hmm. to get the nitrogen. All of the, the, yeah. in the arthropods, the nematodes, the viruses, everybody else. Nitrogen. They're all living on either the fresh organic matter from the plants or somebody who's eating the fresh organic matter from the plants. And so the more of that biology that we can stimulate, the more we can come back to rebuilding this granular structure. So what are some things that we would do to encourage that? To en Okay, we need plant growth, right? And it's going to be harder for plants to grow with the platy structure there. So what are things that we can do to encourage more plant growth? And, and apply as much readily available carbon that we can as readily available to the bacteria. Probably the best way to do it would be outwintering. 
you already have the mackerel breaking down that grass. It's applying bacteria with the readily available carbon along with a nitrogen source with a CNN ratio that's ready to go. We'll manage so grazing. We're, we're, we're providing fuel. Providing fuel, fuel and, and, the, and the machine to keep it going. Yeah, so yeah, where, does, like where does compost fit in on that? That is the same thing. Because that, I'll, I'll, when I uh, bought a farm that was continuously corn and beans for 14 years, and I had a guy chisel plow it, and he said it was the most ungodliest thing. He had this big, I don't know how big a John Deere it was, it was a four-wheel drive, and he had a little Ten shank chisel plow, and I was watching him, and it tractor was smoking, and I was eating dinner, and I told him, "Do not go too fast, because if you go too fast with a chisel plow, you basically straighten the teeth out, and you don't do anything." And I went out there, and I said, "You're not listening. You're going too fast." And he said, "No, I'm not. I'm going less than five miles an hour. I can't pull it if I go any faster than that." He said, "What do you do?" And this is true. That soil was flakes. You could take it, and we we cultipacked it, and we dissed it. We could not get it. And we put compost on it. We put a lot of it on, and everybody said you put too much. I don't think you can put too much compost on, because we had it. We had it in spots. It was at least four inches thick, and we we put it. We tilled it back in. We you know worked it back in, and t and it took a while. But that soil, uh, I don't know who was that. Matt Hartwig's pasture walk. When we went that pasture walk, that was a piece of that property where we were on in the back part. That was packed so hard and it took forever. That stuff would not grow, grass would not grow any higher than that for the first couple of years and we just kept on adding compost on it. And you start getting soils like this. And there was absolutely no worms present. <laughs> absolutely none. Um, you just made me think though, you just said what makes grass grow or how you make grass grow. Well, you graze it. No. If you, yeah. And if you graze it a lot. But, if you, but did you look at, because at, we took our sample here and I looked at this top just the top of that. Look what look what's all on top of this. And that's that's all organic matter, or a large large percentage of it. And it, it, it's not it's not uh, because of luck that Peter's got this though. I mean it's right. when he starts going to five percent organic matter on this soil, uh, it's a lot less prone to I mean, a lot less prone to compaction. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, well, and, and let's talk about that grazing management part of this puzzle too. We get to Diane earlier before lunch. You know, when you're walking out here, it's just so soft. I mean, yeah, we got a lot of rain, but even even if this soil was dry, I think it would still feel soft. Yeah, because you, I mean, yeah. you know, like you said, there's a lot of organic matter here, but this is such a dense sward, and uh, we didn't visit any of the pastures that you've been on recently. But how how much how much standing residue would you leave? I mean, on average, after you go through four, four, four. So when he's done grazing, there's still four inches of this left. You know, that's a really nice cushion. And so even when things are really wet, that can help to keep some of that compaction from happening. And if a little bit does happen, you've got lots of organic matter there for all that biology to work with. So, you know, it's a kind of a continuous cycle and one thing feeds into the next. But um, what about, um, so, so there's management things that play into it as far as grazing management. Are there any fertility things that you think would be important to helping to restore structure to a damaged soil? Doesn't the gypsum usually help? Gypsum? Yeah. 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 Can you explain the, the process a little bit? <laughs> Other than <laughs> adding the sulfur and, and uh, calcium to it, it's supposed to help. Yeah. Infiltration is what I know. Yeah, and, and it does. Um, just providing basic fertility if we need it. I didn't really answer your question, Peter. How much, how much potassium to put on? Is that what you were actually asking? Well, or, just or how does it, you know, in the situation like this, how do you go about to figure out where you are? I mean, okay. I mean, I don't want to say I don't want to spend anything on it, but how? What's the most easiest way? To, you know, what, what are some checkpoints a person can do? Okay. Like you said, you feed test. Okay. The yield. What other, you know? identify things out that your guy could do with what can we do on a regular basis or what some I indicators okay so I'm going to answer that and then um, I want to tie it into what we're talking about here because we want to make sure we've got good fertility right because if we don't have enough fertility for the plants to be vigorous it's going to be difficult for them to grow through that and repair this 
soil. So I like a soil test as, as one shot. I like forage, wet chemistry tests, and everything. I also like looking at what's going on. Now you've had a bunch of rain this week, and even even a fairly poor fertility field can look really nice when the weather conditions no. are perfect. perfect. Things look good, yeah. <laughs> um, but if you come out here, like say, was it dry here in August? You come out here in August and look at things, how things are growing. That will tell you a lot. And if you if you have a soil test and you know what the forage test looks like, and you see what the pastures are actually doing when they're challenged, when they're when you, when you're trying to manage through tough conditions, then you'll have a, a really good complete picture. So. Address those nutrient needs as you need them. And, and the calcium in the gypsum can be really, really helpful. It's not so much a plant nutrient. I mean, it's it's an important plant nutrient, but most of our soils aren't starved for, for calcium as a plant nutrient. But the physical effects of calcium on the soil work be, because of the, the size and the electrical nature of the calcium ion. The calcium ion has two positive charges. Clay particles in the soil have negative electrical charges and so things with opposite electrical charges are attracted to each other and so because calcium has two it can it can attract a clay particle on one side to it electrically and it can attract a clay particle on the other side to it electrically and now instead of two clay particles floating around in space independent of each other now they're they're bound together and then there can be another calcium and another clay and another calcium and another clay and so, chemically, you can start laying the groundwork for aggregation by making sure that there's enough calcium in the soil. Calcium does it better than anything else. And so gypsum is one source of soluble calcium, and so that's one way that we can do that. Again, too, you know, if you need to bring the pH of your soil up, what do you lime on? Lime is another wonderful source of calcium. So Maybe with, with the lime, could you just use the lime and maybe get the double, double bang? Yeah, if you need to adjust your pH, most of the time around here, we've got plenty of magnesium. So most of the time around here, the pH for the limestone will be good. And if your soils, if you test for the first time, say, and you find out that your soils are just terribly acidic, most of the time in this part of the world, we have to pay a little more for calcitic lime than we do for dolomitic lime. The ordinary stuff that goes in the quarries. And if your pH turns out to be 5.6, you know, it, calcium and magnesium ain't the biggest problem here, folks. You gotta fix the acidity. So put on something that's cheap to get started and start working on this and get the pH up close, and then you can do all this fancy fine tuning. Yeah, Kevin. I'd say though, if you want to get it going quicker, the fine high calcium lime will, will get you there a lot faster. Well, fine, fine dolomitic lime will get you there even faster than that. <laughs> And cheaper? Is that the, yeah, the cheaper? Yeah, I'm cheap. <laughs> is, the, is the high cow allowed in organic? Or? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Does everybody understand what you can and can't use with organic? Limestone of any sort is fine for organics. You can't use kill dust. It's a terrific yeah. lime. I love it, but we can't use that. There's too much calcium oxide in it. We can use wood ash if you need potassium and you have an acidic soil. Wood ash is fabulous. Potassium sulfate. For, salt, for potassium, if you need to do that. If you don't have enough, I keep forgetting to come back and address, address your original question, Peter. Um, I really like to make use of the nutrients that people have on their farms before we start bringing on their stuff. Okay. You're probably never going to have enough salt from whatever you've got to work with. So you're probably going to have to look at bringing some sulfur in. You're probably going to have to bring some boron in. But those are small amounts of things. But for, for the big, the big nutrients, you know, the macronutrients, phosphorus and potassium, manure is fabulous, and, and it comes with every dairy farm. So try to make the best use of the manure that you can. And you know, whether you're using the basic nutrient management soil tests from the UW, or you're doing the more elaborate ones that most organic farmers like, you're going to see phosphorus and potassium numbers on there. And a lot of times, it's going to be way back there that you need to take the manure. 
Yep. Because for like the last five generations, people have, have brought it really close to the bar in the winter. It's cold. <laughs> year after year after year. <laughs> so you probably are going to have to go back out there. And did, did I understand you saying, Peter, you, you put your water systems uh, toward the back of the paddock so the cows have uh, like in this paddock, the cows come in from this side. Yeah. Water goes on the opposite side where they're pretty much they're going. And, and that's a really yeah. terrific management idea. Try to, try to use those tools like that to distribute your nutrients or or because the cows are just going to do this stuff because they're cows. So, um, I, I would say too, as you work with people that have chronically overgrazed pastures, um, patience is going to be the key because um, they've driven the, the, the plant populations to things that can tolerate short grazing. Even the, even the desirable plants are going to be shorter um, Partly because they've selected for those, but also because of the changes in the soil underneath it, they just can't grow very tall. But um, you know, don't expect just because they change a few management practices that it's going to happen right away. Then uh, it's going to be a process. Then don't let people get just discouraged because they don't see results. A lot of results the very first year. Then it takes time to all for all those changes to take place. Does everybody understand? Um, Nodules and legumes? Is that something you want to talk about? I'd love to hear you talk about it. <laughs> 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 not at all. I'm also really enjoying the background you music, so we can listen to that cow bell? bells. Yeah, that, that, yeah, cow bells good. for their 10 minutes, you know, we can keep talking. We got 10? Yeah, minutes? we got 10. You know, like we talked about in there, we want to have enough clovers or legumes of some sort out here to support the nitrogen needs of the pasture, as well as making good feed. And one thing I really like to do is I, I love to look at legumes, at the roots of legumes, to see what the nodulation pattern is. is the nodules are, are the, the little growths on the roots where the rhizobia bacteria live that are able to take the nitrogen gas out of the air and convert it to organic forms that they use and then and that, that end up getting distributed throughout the sward to fertilize the, the entire pasture. And so, uh, White clover is, is tougher to do this with, and, it, and it, the soil's really wet, and we've got a great root density here. Is it red? You want to try there. It on okay, excellent. Sure, get to the real plant here. Yeah, okay. I know. It's hard to find this yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> it's too yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's, so, it my it's it, it, we're going to be lucky if we pull this off because oh. this <laughs> is such a <laughs> dense <laughs> root <laughs> system here. <laughs> That you, a lot of times when you try to, oh, you try to take this apart from existing <laughs> soil, you, you end up pulling the, 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 nodules the nodules off the legumes. So it's easier if you've got a little bit drier soil and you've got a bucket of water that you could just kind of swish and swish and swish and, and wash the soil off. But we'll see what happens. So <laughs> we're going to bring Mark out here every week, otherwise Peter wouldn't have any. We'll see if we can be getting cows over tripping in the holes. <laughs> <laughs> ready for a complete so, renovation. So we, <laughs> we want to have... He doesn't know it yet. We want to happening. have enough legumes out there to be able to do this, but then we want to make sure that the roots of the, of the legumes are well nodulated because if they're not well nodulated, then that means that they're not doing the job that we, we've asked them to do. So does that mean it's not as healthy as it should be? There's there's That's... something wrong. There's something wrong. So well, is it because, for example, you apply it they get lazy, right? Yep, they get lazy when that happens. It doesn't hurt the bacteria, but this is this process of biological nitrogen fixation is very energy intensive. You know, that's why when they have synthetic nitrogen factories, they do it where they can get easy energy because this this takes a huge amount of energy and it takes a huge amount of energy to do it biologically too. So, okay, if if I'm if I'm looking for a job and I see that there's a job that's out there that pays fifty thousand dollars a year, but uh, you know I have to work eighty hours a week, and the, the the working conditions are really harsh and everything like that. You know I consider doing that. You know fifty thousand dollars. That's that's a nice salary. However, if somebody just gave me fifty thousand dollars and all I had to do was sit and watch the Packers, I'm going to watch the Packers. <laughs> so if if we put nitrogen fertilizer or manure. <laughs> on clovers or alfalfa or whatever, they're going to sit and watch the Packers. It's protein. It's a good protein. Yep. So it doesn't hurt them, but they just, there's no point in expending all that energy. 
And my explanation was if you win the lottery, you might not go out and work. Yeah, you're actually working. So how do we do that? Anybody know how we determine whether the nodules are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? <laughs> yep, yep. And what are we looking for, Bill? Make sure they're white. White. They're Make white. Sure they're white. No. Right. We don't want them to be white. Oh. Right. Red. Reddish. 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 Yeah, they all want to be reddish. Reddish like uh, Peter. Peter's shirt. That, that's a color. So, so you take a nice sharp knife. I'm looking, I'm looking for some white clover. Yeah, right. No, no, no. Does anybody see another red clover plant here? Because that's just so much easier. Oh, that's too easy. You know what? Why don't we... Why don't we, I'm just going to steal one of these nodules off here rather than digging up Peter's hole faster. Yeah, I was just going to say, we might, I don't we might, think he we wants might find hole. a. If I keep Every digging. time your shovel goes in, you see his face. <laughs> <laughs> He's cringing. <crazy. laughs> Cutting worms in half. Is there one branch in the <laughs> Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is take my jackknife and I'm going to dissect one of these. You have to have really good eyes or else. You know, a 20x magnifying glass works good, which I didn't bring. Hey. Where's the red one on the white clover? Are you? Are you? Somebody slicing some open? Not slicing. There's only. There's only. Nobody's got a pocket knife. Like a, you know, sharp sharp. These guys here. So when, when we see that that's red, we know that the nodule's working. We know that that process is going on the way it's supposed to. So if it's not, you know, we got to figure out why not. Is, is the soil compacted or is there a micronutrient deficiency? Uh, there's a lot of micronutrients that are involved in these enzymes that go on and then in this process of biological nitrogen fixation. So we, we, you know, we have to make sure that we're thinking about all these things. Or it also could be that because they all were for you. This might be a species of legume that's never been grown here before, and we forgot to inoculate the seed. So inoculating. Your seed, even you know, and I like to use inoculated seed, even when I'm going into a pasture where there's been that species there before, because I'm just absolutely sure that I'm getting the right species of bacteria to go with that species of lake. So what I'm talking about here is that there's this beautiful clover stand here. If we came in here with soybeans, which we don't want to do that, of course, but just say we did, that's a different species of bacteria that inoculates soybeans than what grows with, with clover. Now the clover bacteria might be able to form nodules on the soybean, but they're not going to work. They won't, they'll never be red. That species of bacteria will never make a red nodule on a soybean. So, you know, think about these things and, and think about what might be going on here. I've heard some of the seed dealers telling people we flew it in an organic field that had We saw it.